Aloha guys, Dr. Tom is coming back at you with more about the skeletal system. Okay, when we left off, we just got through talking about fractures and how in modern times, currently, a closed fracture means it's within, surrounded by tissue still. Open means it's punctured through and out in the environment, which is not good. These used to be called simple and compound. Now, they're not anymore, and I wished it, that had been there. Anyway, we mentioned a green stick. There are many other kinds of fractures, too, but these are the major ones we're talking about. Now, it's probably going to take us two, video, two more videos to get through all this material, so we'll move. All right, at the very beginning, we mentioned the axial skeleton. It's the skull, the hyoid bone, which is a tiny little bone up in here, the vertebral column, thoracic cage, ribs, sternum, thoracic Vertebra, the vertebral column has the sacrum and the coccyx also with it. Everything else is the appendicular, which is basically the arms and legs. Bones of the skull. Cranial bones, facial bones, hyoid bone, middle ear bones. Yeah, there's three tiny little bones in the, in the middle ear. The smallest bones, I, I suppose, in the body. Okay. Now, guys, this looks a little complicated. Once you get into it, it's not too bad. Here's the good news. Once you learn the bones of the skull, when we start learning the lobes of the brain, they're exactly the same name. So there's the frontal bone, there's the frontal lobe, there's the temporal bone, there's the temporal lobe, and so on. Okay? So, the bones of the cranium, the skull first. The frontal bone is in green. There are two parietal bones in blue. Here's the word. There are two temporal bones down by the temples bilateral and then in the back of the skull there's the occipital bone so we have one frontal bone two parietal two temporal and one occipital bingo that's the bones in the skull now the facial bones eh, a little more we have two nasal bones the bone with the upper teeth is called the maxilla the jaw bone is called the mandible there's a little tiny bone that separates the nasal cavities called the vomer. Um, there are, these cheekbones are called the zygomatic arches. Now, again, here's the word. They're bilateral. It says zygomatic bone. It's always, always called the zygomatic arches. You can actually, in a skull, you can take an ink pen or a thin finger and put it down behind those. Okay, now some of this other stuff, like... The zygomatic process, styloid mass, those are all parts of the temporal bone, okay? The most complicated part is the uh, sockets that the eyeballs fit in is called, are called the orbits. And there's about three different bones that make those up, several different. So moving along, here's the cranium again. This is looking up from a bottom view. Here's the occipital. Uh, there's also two more important bones in the, in the uh, cranium we haven't mentioned yet. Um, uh, where are they? Ah, well, well this here it is. The sphenoid bone, purple one. It's, it's like a bat or something. It's really hard to discuss. We also, the hard palate is also bone. This big hole here is called the foramen magnum, and that's the hole in the occipital bone that the spinal cord comes down through. Foramen magnum. Occipital condyles, this is what the spine articulates to. Okay. External auditory meatus, that's the hearing, the holes we hear out of. I want to hold off on these processes right now. We got to learn the bones first, guys. Senoid bone, this is what I'm saying. Butterfly shape form, forms the floor and sides of the cranium. Celotersica is a little groove, or, uh, I'm sorry, a little indention where the, uh, uh, the uh, master gland, pitu uh, pituitary gland is... Uh, it sets down in it like a, a ball. And then the ethmoid bone is another one. It's deep in there. It's hard to see. Now, however, those are the bones of the cranium, man. You've got it already. Facial bones again. The mandibles, the jawbone, maxillas, upper teeth. Palatine, we didn't talk about those. Zygomatic arches. And there's some other ones. Okay, we all know we have sinuses. There are a number of sinuses. Actually, 
There are frontal sinuses here, which are, these are like cavities in the holes in the bone. Maxillary sinuses here. And then the sphenoid and the ethmoid bone have little tiny sinuses. They lighten the weight of the skull and modulate the sound of our voice. That's why if somebody's having sinus problems, it, it kind of deadens their voice, makes it sound odd. Okay, bones have joints in them, but they're in, in, in the adult. They're immovable joints. Once they fuse, they lock in place. And they're called sutures. Now, what else is called a suture? No, well, that's the official name when you get stitches at the doctor's office. They're called sutures. Three sutures are coronal, amdoidal, and squamosal. Seems like I remember that as something else. Now, in the infant, as we said earlier, the... Uh, uh, the bones haven't fused entirely. A lot of them are still cartilaginous. And it allows flexibility in the skull uh, during the birthing process when they're coming down the chute, if you'll excuse me, my expression. Here it is. So in, the, in an infant, the uh, uh, joints have not fused entirely, so there's soft tissues between here. And then throughout childhood, it, it ossifies and eventually becomes entirely enclosed where it's a solid bone all the way around the brain okay assuming there's no questions now guys i know we went through that quickly but you can always go back over it with a, a videotape like this you just go back and click where you want to see and watch it again the vertebral column the spinal column is so important that it's an entire classification within biology the vertebrates like mammals, dogs and stuff have a spinal column too. Snakes do a lot of a lot of all the advanced animals have some sort of a, a vertebral column. Okay, the neck is the cervical spine. The mid back is the thoracic spine. The lower back is the lumbar spine, and at the bottom we have the sacral bone, inverted triangle, and the little coccyx tailbone. Now, if you look at the vertebral column from a lateral view. There are curves that should be there. If you look at it from the front or back, it should be straight. Oftentimes it isn't, but it should. But if you look at it from a lateral view, now here's the front of the body here. There should be a cervical curve, a thoracic curve, a lumbar curve, and then the sacral curve. And those curves are important. They're supposed to be there. Sometimes they can be uh, too curved, like a person that's hunched back, which is called a kyphotic uh, thoracic curve but these are there for important reasons and here this uh the first two vertebrae have a separate name the c1 is the ax, atlas c2 is the axis but every other one just is just numbered like the ninth thoracic vertebra is just t9 here it is the fourth lumbar vertebra is just l4 the fifth cervical vertebra is just c5 which is good you know now, guys, when these stack on top of each other, there's a, they form a tunnel right down through here. And the spinal cord goes down through there. So it's surrounded by bone. Also, between most of the vertebrae, there are intervertebral discs. You've heard of those. People talk about a slip disc or rupturing a disc. Uh, there's discs between all the vertebrae except C1 and C2 and C1 and uh, the occipital bone of the skull. Vertebral column function supports structure for the head and thorax. Yeah, because all the ribs attach to the vertebra also, guys. The, the thoracic vertebra, the 12. Attachment for the pelvic girdle encases and protects the spinal cord. Provides for flexibility, named according to location. C1. C1 and C2, the atlas and axis, are quite unique. They're unlike any other vertebra. And, and they're, the way they're built, it allows us to rock our head and to rotate our head around like that. Other vertebral parts, vertebral foramina, that's the holes in there. The body, lamina, spinous process, padded by intervertebral discs. Let's see if they show. Each region of the spine, guys, is unique. So, for example, here's, well, C1 is the most unique vertebra of all of them. It's, it's a bony ring. And C2 is also, the axis is also quite unique. And it has a projection called the odontoid process or it's also called the dens and then each like here shows a thoracic vertebra these are the, the the bumps you see on somebody's back 
These are called spinous processes. Here they are. And then we have transverse processes that go out to the side. Now this is looking straight down at these vertebrae from above. Here's the frame and this is what the spinal cord goes down. So these things are like blocks with holes in them and they stack on top of each other and the spinal cord goes down through the center. Now these openings here are where nerves come off the spinal cord and go out between the vertebrae. Okay. If you're thinking it's complicated, you're right. It's really complicated. Characteristics of vertebra. Body is supported by a cartilaginous disc, the, the intervertebral disc. Supports weight of the vertebra. Some processes provide sites of attachment for ligaments, tendons, and muscles. It's really complex, guys, with that, too. There's, there are a bunch of little, small ligaments and big ligaments and tiny little muscles and big muscles. And it's, to say it's complex is really an understatement. Some articulate with bones. Vertebral foramen is opening for the spinal cord. Again, it's blocks with holes in them stacked on top of each other. Bodies of vertebra padded and separated by cartilaginous discs. The, they're, all, they're called IVDs, intervertebral discs. Okay, now we talked about the curvatures of the spine. And we said sometimes they're too, too big. When viewed from the back or the front, the spine should be straight. If it deviates like this, this is called scoliosis. And this is really common, especially in young teenage girls, and more so in women. A hunchback where it's too curved is called a kyphosis. And then if the lumbar curve is too, uh, too deep, it's called a swayback. These normally, guys, don't cause a lot of trouble, but if a scoliosis gets real bad, um, they have to have rods put in their spine and all, but it has to be bad before it gets to that point. Thoracic cage. The breastbone is called the sternum. It has a little part at the top called the manubrium. The main part's called the body. And at the end, there's a little tip called the xiphoid process. Okay. The 12 thoracic vertebrae have 12 pairs of ribs attaching to them. Seven are true ribs, five are false ribs, which means they only attach to cartilage. And the very bottom ones are called floating ribs because they don't attach at all except in the back. And then, of course, there are 12 thoracic vertebrae. Let's see if we see. Here's a picture. Now, we have costal cartilages. Costal means rib in blue here. And this allows the rib cage to expand when we breathe. Otherwise, if it was just bone, we'd have, our stomach would have to like a bellows, you know. Here's the manubrium, the body, the xiphoid process of the sternum. These are the collarbones. Here's the spine. This is looking at it from the front. Here are the ribs, numbered 1 through 12. Now, one of my favorite stories. In the 90s, I was teaching at a big community college in Florida, and I taught pre-nursing classes, and I taught anatomy. And when we got to this part, one of the students in class got kind of upset. And she said, whoa. How come, what, what do you, how come that shows men and women having 12 ribs each? I said, well, well you know, be, because they do. No, no, in the Bible, in the Bible, uh, God took a rib from Adam and made Eve, so, so women have one more rib than men. I said, well, you know, I, I, I'm not trying to in any way uh, disappoint you or conflict your religious beliefs and all, but I'm sorry to tell you, but yes, men and women each have 12 ribs. She didn't like them, but she didn't say any more. I'll leave it at that. Lines and angles, mid, mid sternal line, mid clavicular, the collarbones are clavicles. So there's a mid sternal line right down the sternum, mid clavicular lines about where the nipples are. Costal margins, costal means rib, costal angle, angle of Louis. This is a lot of stuff, guys, I know. Where the manubrium and the body of the sternum come together, there's an angle right here. You can palpate it or feel it, and that's the angle of Louis. It's important because it's a good anatomical landmark if you have to count rib spaces and stuff. You can start here. The angle of the ribs is also important. I'm about to run out of time here. Bones of the appendicular skeleton. There's the shoulder girdle, scapula, clavicles. We're going to go over this more in a minute. Upper limbs, pelvic girdle, coxal bones, lower limb. Now remember, they don't show another picture. That's why I went over in the other video at the first of it. Okay, guys, we're running out of time. When we come back, 
We're going to talk about the appendicular skeleton. We'll see you then. Dr. Tom signing off.